Hello and welcome back. Today we're going to take a look at how much information we can extract from the question of what exactly does I factorial equal to. And we're going to need a bunch of tools for our analysis. The first and foremost is the gamma function, which is an extension of the factorial function to non-integer values. So we know that gamma n plus 1 equals n factorial where the gamma function defined as an integral is gamma z equal to the integral from 0 to infinity of t to the z minus 1 times e to the negative t dt. Another tool related to the gamma function is something called the Weierstrass infinite product form for the gamma function, which I think is extremely elegant, and I have used this to derive some crazy looking results in the past. And finally, we have one of my favorite tools, that is Euler's reflection formula for the gamma function. So the first thing we can do here is restate the problem of i factorial as gamma i plus 1. And from the recursion formula, that means we have i times gamma i. And using the integral form for the gamma function, we have i times the integral from 0 to infinity of t to the i minus 1 times e to the negative t dt. Unfortunately, we can't tackle this integral directly, but there's a way to sort of work around this issue, and that workaround rests on the idea of the absolute value of i factorial. This, of course, equals the absolute value of gamma i plus 1, which, of course, equals absolute value i times gamma i, which equals absolute value i times absolute value gamma i, and because the absolute value of i is just 1, we have the absolute value of i factorial equal to the absolute value of gamma i. But what can we extract from this information? Well, we know what the absolute value of a complex number equals. That equals the square root of the complex number times its conjugate. So we have gamma i times the complex conjugate of gamma i. And this is actually really nice to work with because for the gamma function, we have gamma z conjugate equal to gamma z conjugate or conjugate of gamma z, however way you want to pronounce that. The writing is much more clear than the way I'm trying to read it out loud. Anyway, it's very easy to prove this using the Weierstrass representation for the gamma function, which I'm just going to copy down here. So I think I'm going to miss out on the infinity as the upper limit. Okay, cool. So we're going to replace z here by z conjugate. So we have gamma z conjugate equal to e to the negative gamma times z conjugate divided by z conjugate times the infinite product from k equals the product over k from 1 to infinity anyway of 1 plus z conjugate divided by k to the negative 1 times e to the z conjugate divided by k. And this is very easy to work with because we know that z1 z2 conjugate equals z1 conjugate times z2 conjugate and z1 divided by z2 conjugate equals z1 conjugate divided by z2 conjugate which is pretty cool because it applies to all the products and the fractions we have over here for example the Euler Mascheroni constant. It's a real number, so its conjugate equals itself. So we have e to the negative gamma z conjugate divided by z conjugate. So we just have this conjugate operator looming over the entire first term. And for the terms in the product over k from 1 to infinity, we have, again, we know that z1 plus z2 conjugate equals z1 conjugate plus z2 conjugate. So we have 1 plus z by k conjugate to the negative 1 times e to the z by k conjugate. So we basically have this big conjugate operator looming over the entire infinite product form. That is e to the negative gamma z divided by z times the product over k from 1 to infinity of 1 plus z by k to the negative 1 times e to the z by k, which we of course recognize as the conjugate of gamma z. And this is a pretty cool relation we have because for the absolute value of i factorial, which we just saw equals square root gamma i times gamma i conjugate now equals square root gamma i times gamma negative i. 
But again, it doesn't seem like we're any closer to an exact value for absolute value i factorial. Well, we are indeed very close. Recall Euler's beautiful reflection formula, which we could write in a slightly different form, because by the recursion formula, this thing should equal negative z times gamma negative z. And we know that this thing here equals pi divided by the sine of pi times z. So that means we have gamma negative i equal to pi divided by, well, first things first, we have a negative i term there, and we have a gamma i term there, which is very convenient. And we have the sine of i times pi. Okay, cool. So this implies that absolute value i factorial equals, well, what do we have? We have the square root of gamma i times pi divided by negative i times gamma i times sine of i times pi. Immediately we see the cancellation of gamma i terms, which is again very convenient. And we're left with root pi divided by negative i times sine of i times pi. And we know that sine of i z equals i times the hyperbolic sine or the cinch of z using the definitions of the sine and hyperbolic sine function from complex analysis. I can even prove this very quickly for those of you unfamiliar. We have sine z equal to e to the i z minus e to the negative i z divided by 2 times i. So replacing z here by i times z we have sine of i times z equal to e to the i squared z, which is of course negative z. Then we have e to the positive z divided by two times i. And this thing would be, well, one over i is negative i, so we have negative i here. We get rid of the negative sign by changing the order of the terms up top. And this whole thing, being multiplied by i is, of course, the hyperbolic sine function. So we have i times hyperbolic sine, or cinch of z, equal to sine of i times z, which is, again, extremely convenient, because that means we have square root pi divided by negative i times i times hyperbolic sine of pi. That would be negative i squared, which is negative negative 1, which is, of course, positive 1, which implies that the absolute value of i factorial is indeed equal to pi divided by the hyperbolic sine of pi. Now, folks, this is an extremely cool result in its own right, but we still would like a little bit more information about i factorial itself. So maybe we can come up with a nice approximation for it and then see how good that approximation is given we know the absolute value of i factorial, so we could work out the absolute value of our approximation and see exactly how far from the true result we really are, and, well, how good the approximation is. So for the approximation, let's make use of this infinite product form for the gamma function. And we'll let z here equal to 1 plus i, and for the approximation, we're going to make use of the first two terms in this product. So we have gamma i plus 1, which we know to be i factorial, approximately equal to e to the negative gamma times 1 plus i divided by 1 plus i, and for k equal, for k equal to 1, we have 1 plus 1 plus i divided by 1 to the negative 1 times e to the 1 plus i divided by 1 again. Okay, cool. So this thing equals e to the negative gamma times 1 plus i times e to the 1 plus i divided by 1 plus i times, well, we have 2 plus i. Okay, cool. Now multiplying the exponentials up top, we have e to the 1 minus gamma plus i times, again, 1 minus gamma divided by expanding the multiplication multiplication down here. We have 2 plus 2i plus 1i, that's going to be 3i. Then we got negative, uh, we got positive i squared, which is negative 1, so that's a 1 plus 3i down here, which is pretty cool. 
And now we don't want a complex number in the denominator, so we'll expand using the conjugate. So we have 1 minus 3i divided by 1 minus 3i. So we have e to the 1 minus gamma times e to the i times 1 minus gamma divided by, well, we got 1 squared plus 3 squared, which is, well, 10. And we have 1 minus 3i over here. And we can expand the complex exponential again using Euler's formula. So we have e to the 1 minus gamma times, uh, wait, divided by 10 times the cosine of 1 minus gamma plus i times the sine of 1 minus gamma times 1 minus 3 times i. And now for the multiplication. So we have this thing multiplied by, let me see what we get. We have cosine of 1 minus gamma. And I'll just write out the real and imaginary parts explicitly. So we have cosine 1 minus gamma. And you'll have a negative i squared there which is positive, so we have plus 3 sine of 1 minus gamma, that's our real part. And what about the, wait, have I closed the parentheses properly? Yeah, it looks like, it. okay, it's cool. Now what about the imaginary part? Well, the imaginary part would be i times e to the 1 minus gamma divided by 10 times, what exactly are we working with? Well, we have, a positive sine of 1 minus gamma minus 3 cosine of 1 minus gamma. So after some calculator work, we have this approximation for i factorial. And by the way, for my calculations, I actually approximated the euler mascheroni constant as 0.58, for which I feel terrible about, but at this point the approximations have accumulated to the point of I shouldn't even care anymore. Anyway, so this is our approximation for i factorial. How good of an approximation is this? Well, let's calculate the absolute value as per our approximation. So my calculations yield 0 0.48, whereas the exact value for i factorial is root pi divided by hyperbolic sine pi, which is, for the first couple decimal places, 0 0.52. So the error in our approximation is around the 8% mark. And because I'm not an engineer, I don't exactly know how good of an approximation this is. So I call my best friend Myers, who is an engineer. And I asked him whether 8% was, was an acceptable error. And the first thing he asked me was, how many terms did I use? I told him I used the first two terms in the infinite product expansion for the gamma function. And he was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We never even go past one. You're already pushing the envelope, bro. Sine x equals x, of course. So I was like, okay, but I have used two terms. And if I remember correctly, approximating using only the first term in the series, in that case, the error was about 50 or 60%. I think it was that, as long as it did not mess up the algebra, but I'm pretty sure the error was, the error should be around that mark. So yeah, I told him the error was about 50 to 60% for the first approximation, and then when I took another term, it's now down to 8%, and he said something very wise. He said that by the axioms of engineering, your improvement in approximation suggests, for all practical purposes, an exponential decay of the error. So, for all practical purposes, the error of 8% is within an acceptable margin. This is not me. This is not even Myers. These are the axioms of engineering via some complicated mechanism we got to the fundamental theorem of engineering of course we know that sine x is equal to x fundamental theorem stuff we don't even have to we don't even have to mention it all the time we know it's true by the axioms of engineering then i asked him what happens if we if we push the envelope a bit further and do like three or four terms he was like the axioms of engineering may break down at that point but that sounded extremely daunting. But even then, try out approximating i factorial using a couple more, maybe three or four more terms. 
of the series of the product of the product expansion for the gamma function by Weierstrass and tell me the results you got so far I think this is actually pretty cool this was a very nice exercise especially the exact form we got for the absolute value of i factorial this thing is absolutely gorgeous and the approximating stuff yeah I'm pretty sure engineers have enjoyed this by the axioms of engineering, we've done a pretty good job here, and I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.